Okay, today's video lecture is going to be on Kingdom Animalia. Please make sure you're filling in your notes organizer as you watch the video lecture. Now here on this first slide, I have sort of an evolutionary tree or evolutionary history of Kingdom Animalia. When we think of animals, we typically think of something that falls in one of these categories right here. Fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, or mammals, or in other words, a vertebrate. But as you can see, there's really a lot more to this kingdom than those animals that we're so familiar with. So let's start by talking about what is an animal? Why do these organisms belong to Kingdom Animalia? All animals are multicellular. They have eukaryotic cells, which means they have the type of cell that has a nucleus and membrane-bound organelles. All animals obtain their nutrition by consuming other organisms, which means they are heterotrophic. And all animals at some point in their life cycle have the ability to move. Now, remember, we learned about plants. They have an outer cell wall as their cell support, but animals do not have that. They do not have a cell wall. The, the cell membrane is their outer layer. And then as, for, as far as reproduction goes, most animals do reproduce sexually, but some are capable of reproducing asexually. Okay, so cell parts for the animal cell um, that you're going to be responsible for knowing. Big ones that animal cells have are going to be the cell membrane, which I just talked about. Now, other cells have cell membranes, but the cell membrane is the outer cell for an animal cell. Um, also, the lysosomes, if you remember from last semester, those are organelles that animal cells have that other uh, like plant cells don't have. And those organelles are responsible for breaking down and digesting uh, waste materials. They have those digestive enzymes. So the mitochondria is another organelle that's really important in the animal cell. Now, other eukaryotic cells have mitochondria. Don't get confused by that. But remember, because animal cells don't have chloroplasts, they can't photosynthesize, they can't capture energy from the sun, so they have to be able to produce a lot of energy because animals need a lot of energy. So the mitochondria is sort of the opposite of photosynthesis. It breaks down food in order to produce energy. Oh, and just going back here real fast, number uh, 2B on your notes organizer, how are animals organized? So we start at the cellular level, and then similar cells make up tissues, and then similar tissues make up an organ, so similar like muscle tissues make up a, a certain muscle, and then similar organs make up an organ system, and then the organism is the living thing, but in the case of animals, it's all of those organ, organ systems working together make up the organism. Okay, so like I said before, when we think of animals, we typically think of vertebrates, animals with, an, with a backbone. But 95% of animals are actually invertebrates. A very small amount of animals are, are vertebrates, the ones that we're more familiar with. So you can see from this pie chart right here, insects alone make up about 50% of all animals. Crustaceans make up about another 30%, and those actually belong to the same phylum. So phylum arthropoda, or arthropods, make up a large percent of animals. You can see mammals here, the animals we are most familiar with, because that's what we are. That's that red, tiny little sliver right there. Okay. So speaking of invertebrates and vertebrates, um, a couple of terms you need to know, exoskeletons and endoskeletons. Exo, we've heard these word parts a million times before, means like outer or exiting. So exoskeletons are tough outer coverings that provide pr protection and prevent water loss of the animal. They have to be shed as the animal grows. So like insects, they have to shed their exoskeleton in order to grow larger. And most invertebrates have exoskeletons except for echinoderms those are sort of the exception to the rule and that's like starfish for example they are invertebrates that have a calcium calcium carbonate um, endoskeleton so an endoskeleton is an internal framework of support in vertebrates, that's an endoskeleton with a backbone and that endoskeleton or that that uh, backbone can be made up of different materials like it like I talked about echinoderms have the calcium carbonate sharks those have cartilage as their endoskeletons and then mammals of course we have bone 
Now, because animals are so diverse, they can be found anywhere on Earth pretty much. So they can be found in marine water, salt waters, like all the way from the warm coral reefs down to the very dark benthic zone. They can be found in freshwater, rivers and streams, like some ponds. They can even be found in wetlands, you know, those sort of like in-between waters. And then, of course, they're found in our terrestrial biome environments, deserts, grasslands, forests, polar caps, and even more than what's listed here. Okay, so I briefly said most animals reproduce sexually, but some do reproduce asexually. So sexual reproduction we're familiar with, that's the production of egg and sperm that have to be joined during fertilization. The animals that are able to reproduce asexually, most of them go through these three processes right here, budding, regeneration, or fragmentation. Um, and some of these we've sort of talked about already, but regeneration, like this flatworm here in this picture, you can chop him up several different ways, and all of those parts are going to regenerate into uh, new flatworms. So he has the ability of reproducing asexually. Now the new flatworms would all be genetically identical to this original parent flatworm. Some animals, like the earthworm, are actually hermaphrodites. They produce both male and female reproductive cells. So they're capable of, um, you know, being sort of whatever they need to be in the moment, but they still require another earthworm to be able to reproduce. So it's still a method of sexual reproduction. Okay, so now as uh, going on to sexual reproduction, that can happen internally or that can happen externally. Internal fertilization is where you have the sperm and the egg joining as a zygote, a fertilized egg, inside of the animal's body. And external fertilization is where the sperm and the egg form the zygote outside of the body. Now, most aquatic animals have external fertilization because it requires, it requires water for that to happen. They basically, you know, the female releases the eggs and then the male releases the sperm. And in the water, the sperm sort of swim their way over to the egg to fertilize it. So that does require moisture. Sharks are sort of... <clears throat> An exception to this rule, they have internal fertilization even though they are purely aquatic animals. Okay, now, after fertilization occurs, that's the zygote, that cell is going to undergo mitosis. So the cell is going to start to divide. We know that. Once it's divided into two cells, that's called the embryo. So from two cells until we have sort of like a, a ball of cells around like the 16 to 20 cell stage, um, that, that is the embryo. Once you have a hollow sphere uh, of cells, that is called the blastula. So that's sort of like a hollow bubble. That's the blastula here. Then that blastula, once it's formed, the it starts to sort of pinch in, in words, and that is called the gastrula. So sometimes you hear that is called like the double bubble stage. So we've got the zygote, that becomes the embryo, then you have the blastula, that hollow sphere of cells, and then that pinches inward and becomes the gastrula. And the gastrula is really what determines the structure of the organism, like how many cell germ layers this, the organism is going to have, whether or not it's going to have you know, a certain type of body cavity. But the cell layers of the gastrula develop into various tissues. So the inner cell layer of the gastrula develops into the endoderm. And that becomes the digestive organs and digestive tract lining of the organism. The middle cell layer of the gastrula becomes the mesoderm and that develops into the muscle tissue and various organ systems of the animal. And the outer cell layer of the gastrula, that's the ectoderm, that develops into the skin and also some of the nervous tissue. So label that on 7B on your notes organizer. Okay, so animal, animals have, have evolved into these very complex organisms, and they're classified based on a certain, you know, a certain list of characteristics, and some of those things are the types of body cavities, the types of tissue layers, how they reproduce, how they develop in those early stages, how they um, digest their food, what type of body symmetry they have, and then other various anatomical features. And this is what you're sort of doing your project on, these different groups of animals found within the kingdom Animalia. So looking at this cladogram here, and there's a, there's a sort of evolutionary tree on your notes organizer as well. See if you can answer those questions. You know, what's, what's the ancient common ancestor for all animals? That's a protozoan, which is an animal like what? What would be considered the original true animal, the oldest here? 
Annelids or segmented worms are most closely related to what other group of animals? Oops, sorry. And then looking at this diagram, what do you think would be the most closely related to chordates? Or which do you think exhibits the closest embryonic development to us, chordate vertebrates? Okay, so moving on, um, let's talk about animal body plans for a minute. Um, I want you to be familiar with the word symmetry. You've probably heard of this in math class before. And oops, that picture got over the words there a little bit. But symmetry is the similarity or balance among body structures of organisms. There are three types of animal symmetry. There's asymmetry, or lack thereof. There's radial symmetry, and there's bilateral symmetry. And you can see that here in the images. So the first type of body plan is asymmetry, or a lack of symmetry. This is when the body cannot be divided evenly across a central plane or axis. And our go-to example for asymmetry is typically sponges. So phylum periphera, those members, they, they really cannot be divided a certain way evenly. Then we have radial symmetry. This is when the body can be divided along any plane through a central axis into roughly equal halves. So some of our examples here would be jellyfish, starfish, and anemones. These are usually very slow moving, almost sessile creatures, um, and they sort of radiate uh, through a central point, almost like the spokes of a wheel. Animals that have radial symmetry have two surfaces, and the surface terms you're going to need to know are the oral surface and the aboral surface. The oral surface, like if you're having oral surgery, you're having surgery on your mouth, maybe you're getting your wisdom teeth removed. So the oral surface of an animal with radial symmetry is going to be the surface with the mouth, and typically that's going to be the underside of that animal. Like the starfish, you find the mouth on the underside, that's sort of what it crawls along against, hoping that it bumps into something that it can eat. The aboral surface is the surface opposite of the mouth. So in the case of the starfish, that would be like the top side. So this brings us to bilateral symmetry, and this is what most advanced animals have. Bilateral symmetry is when the body can be divided into mirror image halves only along one plane through the central axis. So like our little crayfish here, he's got bilateral symmetry. This is a funny little joke because that's actually two dogs. but. Bilateral symmetry can be sort of cut right down the middle. So animals that have bilateral symmetry, they're more complex. They exhibit cephalization, which basically means they have a head end and then a non-head end. And the head end is going to be where you find the concentrated nervous tissue, or in more advanced animals, the brain. So this, the terms you're going to need to know for the bilateral body plan are anterior, posterior, dorsal, and ventral. The anterior end is the head end. The posterior end is going to be the, the opposite end, the tail end. The dorsal surface, that is the backside surface, and the ventral surface, that's going to be the underside or belly surface. And the way that I always remember dorsal versus ventral is the dorsal fin, that's the scary fin on a shark. If you see a dorsal fin, you better run for your life, right? The dorsal fin is found sort of on the backside surface. Okay, so see if you can label your little dolphin picture here, number 11, on your notes organizer. And also use your notes on symmetry to see if you can identify the animals in number 10 as having, uh, being asymmetrical, having radial symmetry, or having bilateral symmetry. Okay, I'm just going to let you pause on this slide. This is what you're doing your project on. These are the invertebrate animals. I just want you to real quickly pause on this and just read over this chart because it really gives you an idea of how we, we went from these very simple animals like sponges into more complex uh, invertebrates like the echinoderms and the arthropods. So pause on this, take a look at this chart. You can even use this for some of your information for your project. Okay, now that you've sort of read some information on invertebrates, take a look at this sort of graphic organi organizer on vertebrates and read just a little bit about the characteristics of our different groups of vertebrates. You have your fish, and you have cartilag cartilaginous fish, and you have bony fish, and then you have your amphibians, which live in water and on land. Then you moved on to your reptiles, which have the amniotic eggs, and then you have your birds, and finally your mammals, which is what we are. So pause on that picture as well. And that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this video lecture on the Kingdom Animalia. Have a great day.